All right, this is going to be our opening song today, so we invite you to stand with us and let's sing. We're on? Testing one, two, three? Okay. I'd like to welcome you to the August 19, 2023 edition of World Watch. Today we're going to be talking about the warning of the howling trees and the destroying uh, shepherds. Um, sometimes the titles, you can kind of guess what I'm going to speak about. Um, this time I don't think you're going to guess quite what I'm going to speak about. It's, um, it's a little different. Oftentimes we think of, dis of, of shepherds as being what? pastors, church leaders, etc. But there's also political shepherds. There's leadership shepherds all around this world. And so we're going to be looking at it from a, uh, a little bit different perspective because I believe that you're going to understand a bit about how the trees are howling. And uh, certainly there are many sobering events going on around us today. 
And it is difficult to hone in on any particular topic because there are so many events going on that have a connection to end time Bible prophecy. I've heard people say before, we shouldn't study the prophecies. They're not for us to know. We should just look on the cozy and the fuzzy stuff. That's not how we see scripture. We believe that the rolling of the, the unrolling of the scroll is happening and Yah through the gift of discernment is giving us knowledge and education on the things that are going on today so that we can discern the times and the seasons in which we live. And that's the blessing of walking with Yah. Remember in the end of the time, right at the end, it says in the scripture, it says the spirit and the bride say come. What bride does not know the date of her wedding, the time of her wedding? Think about it. A very surprised bride. And the bride in Revelation is saying, come to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So she may not know exactly right now, but she will know. And I encourage you to read Revelation chapter 12 in your own private time. I'm not going to review that today. But those are all gifts, every single one of them. And I'm sorry, some of you are anti-moon. I don't know what to do with you. (laughs) I'm going to leave you in God's hands. But the moon is a gift from Jehovah. It's one of the gifts given to the bride. You don't want the moon? That's okay. That's okay. Perhaps Yah has not chosen you to be the bride. That's between you and him, not me. And I don't know how that works for you. That's okay. So today my World Watch presentation will be showing how the end time prophecies found in Zechariah chapter 11, to be specific, are being fulfilled in our world today. See, Zechariah 11 uses some prophetic imagery which we must study out in order to even understand it. And as we do, we'll see the significance and meaning of the howling trees in Zechariah chapter 11 and we'll more clearly understand who the destroying shepherds are through their characteristics and their work as described in Zechariah chapter 11. Now, oftentimes I start with what's going on in the world and I throw some scriptures at the end and show you how it may be fulfilled. Today we're going to do just the opposite, keep you on your toes a little bit. We're going to start with the scripture and then look at the events going on in the world. And I think you'll have discernment. I'm praying for you each to have discernment that we can wake up that we can cry aloud and spare not. Folks, we do not have very long before the soon return of our Messiah. Um, Some people are surprised it's taking as long as it is, but blame it on God's mercy and his grace and thank him for it every day. So it's my prayer that the body of Messiah will be detected, will be protected from the overwhelming deceptions of this time. And as we seek to see current, a key current events through the lens of these prophecies in Zechariah 11, Remember, my focus is not always just on specific events, but how all the events working together are portrayed throughout Scripture and the end-time prophecies. And I believe that's where we need to um, hone in and pay attention. Um, There's really, how many sides are there in the end? Two. Two, Well, wait a minute, only two. But how many different denominations are there? I mean, there's got to be a countless, come on, there's got to be a lot of sides, isn't there? You're right, there's only two sides. There's good and there's evil. And I'm not picking on denominational religion. Uh, That's another talk. But I will say this. We need to be followers of his way. And if we're anything else, folks, the scripture tells us it's not that we might be misled, we will be misled. So let's hone in today. And uh, we're going to start with a word of prayer. Um, I'm going to be lifting a few people up in prayer specifically that are in danger of some fires going on from Canada and into the United States. Um, We need to be praying for the folks in Maui. Uh, I'm going to be mentioning a little bit of that today, just hitting on it. Um, Sometimes you might see things on the screen, but I can't say them verbally uh, because censorship runs abound. (laughs) So sometimes I can just put it on the screen because... Some bad people are writing books and they're talking about it, but I'm not allowed to talk about it. So that's okay uh, with some of the channels that we're uh, broadcasting on. So uh, pay attention to your screen. Don't fall asleep. And I'll try to keep you entertained and educated at the same time, prayerfully. So let's begin with a, a shofar blast and we'll lead right into prayer.
Jehovah, Father, we thank you so much for your loving care to each of your people. I pray as you are preparing your bone army, as you're preparing the bride, as you're preparing your people, however you've chosen us to be and what part you've chosen us to be, Heavenly Father, we submit our lives to you today. We ask you to lead and guide and direct in each of our lives as only you can, and we thank you, Heavenly Father, for what you're already doing and what you're about to do through your people. Heavenly Father, I, I want to thank you for the prophecies that you've put in your word, the prophecies that help us to know what time it is, not that we will live in a spirit of fear, but more importantly, that Heavenly Father, we will sing forth your praises and look forward to your soon return because the fact is, Heavenly Father, as we see prophecies being fulfilled that you've warned us that would come to pass, we know that in the end, you are always in control, and for that, we are grateful. Be with us today. Again, give us the spirit of discernment, as you promised in Revelation 3.18. Uh, touch our eyes with spiritual eye salve that we may know and see and understand. To your honor and to your glory, we ask it, Heavenly Father, in Yeshua's name. Amen. Now, the first kind of prophetic imagery that we're going to look at in Zechariah chapter 11 is the trees. Zechariah 11 verses 1 to 2 says, Open thy doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour thy cedars. Howl for a tree, for the cedar is fallen, because the mighty are spoiled. Howl, O ye yokes of Bashan, for the forest of the vintage is come down. See, the word howl here is referring to wailing with great grief. Obviously, literal trees cannot wait with great grief, but uh, they, can't, they can't literally wail with great grief. But in Bible prophecy, trees actually aren't literal trees, are they? See, trees in the Bible are a symbol of people. Judges 9, verses 8 to 14 tells us, The trees went forth in a time to anoint a king over them, and they said unto the olive tree, Reign thou over us. But the olive tree said unto them, Should I leave my fatness wherewith by me they honor Yah and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? So obviously this is an allegorical uh, uh, speaking here. Um, there's a lot of allegorical uh, uh, Ver, uh, usage of allegories throughout the Old Testament. And Yeshua, God manifested in the flesh, the Son of God, did he not speak in parables? That's kind of allegorical language, so it should be no surprise to us. Um, so things aren't supposed to be hidden, folks. We're supposed to gain knowledge and have understanding. And that knowledge that we gain is supposed to bring in what? Make a smart encyclopedia? No, it's supposed to bring in a life change to us. It's the plan of restoration, the plan of redemption, if you will. Growing things are a prophetic metaphor for people in the Bible. And for example, the Bible uses the following plant metaphors to represent people and even the Messiah himself. Multiply your seed sown. The tares are the children of the wicked. By their fruits you shall know them. I am the vine, ye are the branches. See, the Bible is full of metaphors that compare people with the Christian journey itself to the plant kingdom. It even likens Yah's truth to rain, Deuteronomy 32, verse 2. The Apostle Paul exhorts us to be rooted and grounded in Yah's love, Ephesians 3, verse 17. In Psalms 92, verse 12 on your screen, it says, The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree, he shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. In Bible prophecy, the cedar tree represents righteous leadership. The cedars are those in positions of government and church leadership who worship and obey Yah. I know, it's hard to understand, but there are people in positions of government that actually honor the God of heaven. I'm looking for them too, but I know they're there. As the Bible tells us they're there. The cedar of Lebanon is a cone-producing tree that can grow up to 120 feet tall. Imagine, if you will, a, a, a 10 to 12-story uh, building. Its branches are wide-spreading and go straight out horizontally 30 to 50 feet from the trunk. It was known in biblical areas as the king of the trees. The Hebrew word for cedar comes from a root word meaning firm. It is known for the firmness of its roots. And that's from Jesenius' Hebrew Chaldean lexicon. The adjective form of the word for cedar means firm or strong. 
Cedar trees are strong because of their great root system. Similarly, the righteous leaders are deeply rooted in what? In truth. In truth, which produces righteousness, but they're ultimately rooted in truth. Who is truth? Yeshua. Yeshua said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. What is the foundation of all truth? The Torah. What are the Torah? What is the Torah? A lot of times people refer to the Bible, they use an acronym, Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. That's the acronym for the Bible. It all focuses on what? The New Testament? No, it focuses on the Torah, the instructions, the law of Yah. And when we have that foundation, we can correctly interpret the rest of Scripture. Without that foundation, we're going to be blown about with every wind of doctrine. And don't raise your hand because we've all been blown about here and there, but prayerfully no longer. But a lot of people are pretty windy. A lot of people are blown about with this doctrine and that doctrine. And the fact is, is that they're not foundation. They don't have the, rooted, the root system of Torah. When you have the root system of Torah, like the cedars do, what happens? Discernment. You can spot. You could, you, you, I'm not saying this in a judgmental way, nor are the cedars supposed to be judgmental. But they have the gift of dis discernment. We're not supposed to be judgmental, but does the Bible tell us, us by their fruits you shall know them? So we are fruit inspectors. So you all work for the FDA. Well, okay. I won't hope. No, don't do that. <laughs> FDA is a bad company. Anyway. So Hosea 14, verse 5. Israel shall grow as the lily and cast forth its roots as Lebanon. Remember, Lebanon is referring to the cedars of Lebanon. There's some verbiage here that we need to pay attention and understand, and if we put Scripture together, we have that. How important is it for Yah's people to understand and study and know and live Torah today? Most of modern-day Christianity, if you will, tells you that the law is nailed to the cross, the execution stake. Satan's more than happy to let you think that. Why? Because if you believe that, he can tell you anything he wants. You base your religion on what feels good, not what is good. I think of uh, Henry Blackaby and his Experiencing God uh, program. He says that in his experience, and I, it, I, I'm, I'm re repeating this because I can relate to this and I know my wife can as well. They said when God, he says, when God asks you to do something, rarely, if ever, will it be what you want to do. And it's oftentimes, okay, look at the story of Moses. Yah, you, you want me to go back to, 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 to Egypt? No. <laughs> Why didn't he want to go back to Egypt? Well, he had killed a man. What was he subjected to? Death. He, he, he killed an Egyptian um, taskmaster, if you will, so an Egyptian citizen. And uh, even though he was adopted by the prince, uh, the, 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 uh, I guess the princess, um, he could have been in serious jeopardy, in serious trouble, but he did come back. And who protected him? Yeah. Yehovah. If Yah asks you to do something today, you may not be Moses, I may not be Moses, but guess what? It's the same God. Can he protect you? Absolutely. He can bring you through it. So Israel shall grow as the lily and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. We are not to just study Torah. We are to learn from it and we are to grow with it. And that's what makes us strong. Cedar trees represent leaders who are purified and separated from the world. Their righteous leadership also brings healing and wholeness to those around them. The society itself, if you will. We see this role of the cedars in the Bible, as it says in the Torah in Leviticus chapter 14, cedar wood was used to prepare the water of separation and to purify leprosy. Did you know that? When the leaders of society are strong, as Yahweh taught Nebuchadnezzar, it is because Yahweh has empowered them to be so. So the cedar is illustrative of powerful nations, as we see in Ezekiel 31, verse 3, and Amos 2, verse 9. Again, I'm going to use the example of Moses. 
Do you think Moses was a spiritual narcissist? Oh, God, look what I did for you. <laughs> no, Moses was like, wow, yeah, look what you did through me. Too often times we come to the table and say, yeah, I'm going to do this for you and I'm going to do that for you. As soon as you give me the goal, this is what I'm going to do. That's not how it works for. That's not how it works. And I see throughout Scripture with the prophets and others, it's always, yeah, what would thou have me do? It's not what we bring to the table. I mean, that's good. Use your talents, use whatever you can do to Yah's honor and glory. I'm not saying don't use your talents to glorify your Father in heaven. The Bible says that. But the, 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 the reality is, is that we glorify our Heavenly Father most wholeheartedly when He works through us. And for those of you who have had the privilege of Yah doing that in your life, you get to an experience that you know you had nothing to do with. It was Yah doing it. And you just bring him honor and glory and praise and you go, wow, God, there is nothing too great for you. You know you didn't have anything to do with it. You're just being submitted and committed to his will being done on earth as it is in heaven. It's not a bad day. Cedar again represents the flourishing of saints. Uh, Psalms 92, verse 12, the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Cedars also represent the majesty, strength, and glory of our Messiah. Uh, Song of Solomon 5, verse 15 says, his legs are as pillars of marble set upon sockets of fine gold. His countenance is as Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. And also uh, Ezekiel 17, verses 22 to 23, tells us, In the mountain of the height of Israel will I plant it, and it shall bring forth boughs and, and bear fruit, and be a goodly cedar, and under it shall dwell all fowl of everything. In the shadow of the branches thereof shall they dwell. And all the trees of the field shall know that I, Jehovah, have brought down the high tree, have exalted the low tree, have dried up the green tree, and have made the, the dry tree to flourish. I, Jehovah, have spoken and, and have done it. In Zechariah 11, Yahweh warns us that the day will come that the righteous leaders, referring to the cedars that will be devoured in fire, it, that the, the cedars will be devoured in fire. Uh, again, uh, it says it right here, that the fire may devour thy cedars. Of course, fire represents the glory of Yahweh and holy judgment. But this prophecy has a negative meaning of fire. We can know this because Yahweh's glory and holy judgment do not remove righteous leaders. And it is not the work of heaven to bring down the mighty, God-fearing, old forest of righteous leaders. And that can be found here. The forest of the vintage has come down. What is vintage? That's old. Uh, sometimes when I get up out of bed, I feel, in the morning, I feel ver pretty vintage. I don't know about you, I feel that way. But you know, we're all babies in, Yeh in Yehovah's eyes. Fire in the Bible also represents burning jealousy and consuming destruction. The fire that has devoured the cedars in the last days is brought on by the wicked who are jealous to take the leadership of the land and to consume righteousness. Now, that can't happen, Mark. That's not happening today. Come on. Everyone's just so happy with the Christians today. Really? Have you noticed that every religion is flourishing except the religion of heaven? Notice that the cedars are only destroyed after the doors are what? Opened. Doors are gates which protect and the wall of protection in Scripture is represented as the law of Yahweh. The forest of the vintage in this prophecy is the nation which prospered under the righteous leadership of the cedars. This prophecy applies to what country? The United States. And the free world, which followed its template in the last days.
On December 20 of 1606, 105 colonists and 40 seamen set sail from England to plant this new settlement to the glory of Yah. Robert Hunt was selected as their minister and spiritual leader. The settlers landed on the shores of Virginia on April 26 of 1607. Before permitting the colonists to continue inland, Reverend Hunt required that every person wait before Yahweh in a time of personal examination and cleansing. Three days later, on April 29 of, of 1607, the expedition led by Parson Hunt went ashore to dedicate the continent to the glory of Yah himself. They carried one item with them, a rough-hewn wooden cross. And as the party landed on the windswept shore, they erected the seven-foot oak cross in the sand. The colonists and sailors gathered around the cross, holding the first formal prayer service in Virginia to give thanksgiving for Yah's mercy and his grace. Robert Hunt offered the following prayer on April 29, 1607 at Cape Hen Henry, which is now uh, known as Virginia Beach, Virginia. The prayer is, We do hereby dedicate this land and ourselves to reach the people within these shores with the gospel of Yeshua HaMashiach and to raise up godly generations after us. And with this, these generations take the kingdom of Yah to all the earth. May this covenant of dedication remain to all generations as long as this earth remains. And may this land, along with England, be evangel evangelist to the world. May all who see this cross remember what we have done here. And may those who come here to inhabit join us in this covenant and the most noble work that the Holy Scriptures may be fulfilled. Using this covenantal language, Hunt declared... From these very shores, the gospel shall go forth not only to this new world, but to the entire world. What is the gospel? No. That's part of it. Yeshua preached the gospel. He wasn't dead yet. He did not die for our sins yet, yet he preached the gospel message. What was he preaching? Kingdom. The kingdom of God, which is based on what? Torah. Torah. Folks, Torah is a whole lot bigger than any of us have ever realized. People are waking up and they're seeing it. I'm not saying, why did Yeshua die? Because the wages of sin, according to Torah... The wages of sin is death. Yeshua in his death was preaching Torah. Isn't that good news? I don't know about you, but oftentimes I get to feeling like Isaiah, and sometimes you feel like we're all alone. We're the only ones following Yah. And I hear Yah say, Mark, quit your belly aching. I've got 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal. Just like Isaiah. Elijah, excuse me. We, we get discouraged. And I thought, well, you know, you know, if I had an experience like Elijah and had, remember those 600 and 400 false prophets and, and he slaughtered them all and then he got scared of what? A woman. <laughs> Let that be a, women, pay attention. Men, we're scared of you. No, anyway. No, it's just like the silliest little things. No offense to women, I'm not being that. Um, I'm just saying, sometimes we go through these horrendous, wonderful experiences, and then we get scared. Why? We have nothing to fear for the future, lest we forget how Yah has led us in the past. Elijah forgot just for a moment, didn't he? And Yah smacked him around a little bit, said, hey, stop it. I got you. You're not doing this on your own. You're doing it because I've empowered you. How many of you are scared of the end of time? Don't raise your hand. Just think about it. Stop being scared. Start glorifying and praising Yah that he's chosen you to believe, to be alive, excuse me, in such a time as this. Didn't someone say that to Queen Esther? Was Esther scared? Just a wee bit. You want me to go before the king? Well, if I had to go there uncalled for... Uh, could be my neck. Perhaps Yah has raised you, has preserved you for such a time as this. 
Don't get prideful. Don't get haughty. Stay humble and watch what Yah will do through you. After this prayer, the following Bible passage uh, was read at the conclusion of the prayer. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to Yahweh, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is Yah's, and he rules among the nations. Psalms 22, verse 27 to 28. Once settled in the, um, in the fort uh, at Jamestown, the whole company, except those who were on guard, attended regular prayer services twice a day, led by the Reverend Hunt under the cover of a tattered old sail until a permanent church could be erected. They built the church in the center of town where they gathered to lift up prayers twice a day. The pattern of worshiping Yahweh and living by the principles of Scripture continued in our country. In fact, it was the basis for the formation of all our freedoms. Truth be told. Did you know it was these religious colonists that printed the first Bible? It was our government. The United States government printed the first Bible in the United States. And they distributed it to, oh, guess where they distributed the Bibles to? What we would known as the public schools. Oh, pagans. <laughs> It, don't you know is a separation of church and state? Have you heard that? Yeah. See, our history has changed. We, we, we believe a lot of things that really just plain aren't true. We, you can find it. There's, there's copies of the old Bible. Bible. Um, uh, my late cousin, um, Ken Porter, uh, he, had, he had taken his family to... Uh, a couple places, but it's the Museum of the Bible. Is that what it's called in Washington, D.C.? Yeah. Uh, he was telling me that they had one of these old Bibles there, and it says it right there who published it. It was published by the Congress of the United States of America. And you're just like, oh! Sorry, Nancy. Anyway. <laughs> the pattern of worshiping Yahweh and living by the principles of Scripture continued in our country until recently. And it's been fairly recently. Yes, it's been progressing down and down and down in the wrong direction. But our religious liberties being pulled away is actually fairly recent. And we're all stand sitting oftentimes in stunned silence, kind of going, uh, shocked. Is this really happening? Yeah, it's happening. Yeah, what are you going to do about it? Oh, well, so I read scripture. In the end, his Torah, his law, his ways prevail. His will will prevail, not ours. So how does it stand with you? What side are you on? Because whether you choose to or not, you're on one side or another. Here's a small sample of the convictions of our founders who are represented as the cedars of Lebanon in Zechariah chapter 11. Patrick Henry, Henry, he was the governor of Virginia at the time. It says, it cannot be emphasized too clearly and too often that this nation was founded nor by, uh, not by religionists, but by Christians on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Put in the Hebrew name, that's fine. That's what I want to do. Hmm. John Adams, the second president of these United States, said the general principles upon which the fathers achieved independence were the general principles of what? Christianity. Torah-based, Bible observance. Charles Carroll, he's one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. He said, without morals, a republic cannot subsist any length of time they, therefore, who are decrying, meaning publicly denouncing the Christian religion, whose morality is so sublime and pure, are undermining the solid foundation of morals, the best security for the duration or the endurance of free governments. They knew that the foundation of our morals, based on Scripture, is what kept us free and that it would endure as long as we stayed there. So if we are, as a nation, 
moving away from Bible observance, if you will, a moral code of ethics, what do you think is going to happen to our nation? I don't think it's going to go too well. John Quincy Adams, the sixth president of these United States, said the first and almost the only book deserving of universal attention is what? The Bible. I speak as a man of the world and I say to you, search the scriptures. He was a man of the world. Was he in the world? But not of the world. Woodrow Wilson. Let's go. Let's move it quite a bit ahead here. The 28th president. I think right now we're president number, what, 46? Some would argue that, but let's not go there. The Bible is the supreme source of revelation. America was born a Christian nation. America was born to exemplify that devotion to the elements of righteousness which are derived from the revelations of the Holy Scripture. The Bible is the supreme source of revelation? Wow. I believe that. It's nice that our founding fathers, the cedars, if you will, were not afraid to say the truth. Who was the smartest man known in Scripture? Solomon. Solomon. What did he say? At the end of his life, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. What was the conclusion of the matter? Fear God and give him the glory. Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he talks about a gentleman in the early church that was doing something that was not even mentioned amongst the Gentiles, and the early church wasn't doing anything about him. I don't know, maybe he was a big tithe payer or something. I don't know. Um, oftentimes that's what happens today. Money talks. Sad. And Paul says, what's wrong with you, church? Don't you recognize you represent the body of Yeshua HaMashiach? You're supposed to be spotless, blameth, with, without blemish. I know we've all sinned and fallen far short of the glory of Yah, but when we come to God, we put that old man to death and we're alive in Messiah. We're living the life that he would have us live. Do you think Yeshua would justify us to keep on sinning? So some people believe that. Oh, I've accepted Christ. He's the object of my faith. And guess what happens? So I'm going to just keep right on sinning. No. Justification as you're justified just as if you never sinned. You don't go on sinning. You die to the old man of sin, and now you're alive in Messiah, who left you an example that you should follow. Did Yeshua ever sin? Think about that very carefully. People up in the pulpit have said this time and time again. Oh, yeah, Christ came to do away with the law, and he, he broke Torah. Folks, what they have just done is they have denied Yeshua as being their Passover lamb because the Passover lamb had to be spotless, blameless. If he had broken Torah, they just rejected him as their Messiah. You see how important that is? That's a big deal. I mean, to me, that'd be a big deal. And I'm not trying to put a square into a round peg. Yeshua didn't break Torah. Okay, let's continue. Sean is going like this. I'm sorry. Thank you, honey. Harry Truman, the 33rd president of the United States, the fundamental basis of this nation's laws was given to Moses on the Mount. The fundamental basis of our bill of rights comes from the teachings we get from Exodus, Matthew, Isaiah, and Paul. If we don't have a proper fundamental moral background, we will finally end up with a totalitarian government which does not believe in rights for anybody except the state. Are we there? Yes. We're, if we're not there, we're way too close.
America was founded by Jehovah. I mean, because of its biblical and godly basis, it was birthed as the first ever nation to be what? Free. This nation was a free nation. As I've shared with you before in Kirk Cameron's powerful documentary called Monumental, The Matrix of Freedom, it's explained, revealing what made America such a blessed and free nation. About 150 years ago, a statute called the Matrix of Liberty was erected on a hilltop overlooking Plymouth Rock. It is the secret sauce recipe, as Kirk Cameron calls it, which shows how to bring freedom to every heart and to every home. Our national leaders back then didn't want us to forget the principles on which our nation was founded, the fundamentals upon which all true freedom is based. The National Monument to the Forefathers, thought to be the world's largest granite monument, has been all but forgotten over the years. The monument is located in, on Allerton Street in Plymouth, Massachusetts, and was commissioned by the Pilgrim Society. Hamat Billings was the architect, illustrator, and sculptor of the 81-foot-tall 80 monument, dedicated on August 1st, 1st of 1889. It honors our founding fathers' Christian ideals and values. And today, if too many people knew about it, they'd say, how dare them? That's how far away we've gone. I wouldn't say that. I'd say, thank you. <laughs> Let's get back to it. A matrix of those ideals and values is, is, is expressed in the form of a monument and dedicated to the pilgrims who sacrificed so much in pursuit of religious freedom. The monument is a blueprint that provides an understanding of how liberty is created and maintained in case we should ever lose it. At the top of the monument, the largest figure is labeled Faith. It is a woman representing Yah's church. She stands straight and true. Her, her hand is pointed up to heaven to show that her faith is in Yah, the one and only true God. This was the faith that birthed America and brought about true freedom. Lady Faith has a star on her forehead to show that as long as she stands in faith to Jehovah, she will be blessed with his wisdom. Also in her left hand is clasped a well-worn Bible. Not a new Bible, a well-worn Bible. What is a well-worn Bible? One that is read, one that is studied, one that is understood. Once again, showing that our nation was founded upon faith in the God of the Bible and his word. Around the base of the monument stand four figures which add dimension to the recipe for freedom. The first is a woman, again representing the church of Yah. She wears the high priest's breastplate, showing an understanding of Yah's government. She's holding the Ten Commandments in her left hand and the scroll of Revelation in her right hand. She is called morality. This shows that the fundamentals of our country were morals of our, of our country. The fundamentals of our country were morals based upon Yah's word and law, not legislation that is contrary to the scripture. In fact, as our government recognized just 150 years ago, there is no freedom in a society that is not governed by Yah's word. The next base statue shows a man seated, again holding Yah's law. This man is named Justice. His side statues show equality and mercy as being a part of justice, which is again enacted according to the law set forth in the Ten Commandments of Yah. Then there's a young woman teaching her child. This statute is called Education. Again, she's holding the word of Yah and educating her children from it. What is the word of Yah? The Bible. Finally, the last figure of the base of the 150-year-old monument is Liberty Man. It's not the one on the commercial, folks. He is shown having vanquished tyranny. This man emblemizes guarding the freedom which comes from living by faith in Yah educating our children, and running our country in the principles of Yah's law and his word. The sword in his hand represents the people's willingness to defend the hard-won liberty and freedoms our country and people enjoy. There was no separation between church and state when our country was founded. Just not true. 
In fact, as this was memorialized 150 years ago, our founding fathers developed the first free nation in the world by making Yah and his law the heart of everything we believed and did. One of the very first acts of Congress, as I mentioned before, was when our nation was young, was to print Bibles and place them in all the public schools. Do you know how many Bibles are in the public school today? No. Not Christian Bibles. There are other Bibles, but they're not Christian. That ought to just, I don't know about you, but that freaks me out. The secret sauce recipe for making America the blessed and free nation, which was truly the leading power of the free world, was faith in God, believing in his word, obedience to his commandments, and instructing our youth according to the scripture. This was what established America as a political house. And now that house is divided against itself as step by step our nation's foundation on yaw and truth is being eroded away. And the Bible prophecy warns us that there will be the end result that what is, excuse me, let me try this again. Bible prophecy warns us what will be the end result for any nation when we turn away from Yahweh in his law. He tells us what the is. He tells us what the end result is. Our society has increasingly rejected the law of Yahovah. We have taken the most wicked and abominable things and have made them mainstream. And the righteous leaders of the cedars have been consumed, bringing down the nation, represented in bringing down the vintage forest. And in its place, we have folks that are preaching from a different Bible. And believe me, politics is a religion. But the politics that's often being promoted today is not the religion of the Christian Bible. It's not Torah-based at all. I know what you see on the screen here happened to be all part of the blue team. But folks, there's some on the red team as well. I'm sure there's some in the independent team. Zechariah's end-time prophecy not only mentions cedars, but also fir trees. The oaks of Bashan, and, and, and the oaks of, uh, of Bashan. Fir trees are those who are pursuing righteousness. They aren't as mighty as the cedars, but they are wise enough to recognize that they should mourn the loss of the righteous leadership in the land. On the other hand, the oaks represent leaders who are filled with pride. Extensive oak forests still exist in Bashan, symbolizing pride and loftiness, as we see in Isaiah uh, chapter 2, verse 13, and here in Zechariah 11, verse 2. The people of Tyre made the oars for their ships from the oaks of Bashan. Today, the righteous cedars have been replaced by the lesser and prideful leadership who are working to take America and the world away from the freedoms that it's enjoyed for so long, which will ultimately bring in the prideful, totalitarian rule of the Antichrist. Both groups are told to mourn the loss of the cedars. We can understand why the fir trees would mourn the loss of the cedars, for they represent people who seek righteousness, but why would the prideful oaks of Bashan mourn? As history clearly shows, when a totalitarian regime rises to power, everyone suffers. It is not only the righteous who are oppressed, everyone, even those who help the dictator rise to power, is oppressed and many are killed under the oppressive rulership of an autocrat. Proverbs 29, verse 2, When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice, but when the wicked bears rule, the people mourn. So the first part of Zechariah 11 warns that in the last days, the former righteous leaders are brought down, bringing down the old forest of the, our free society. And this causes the mournful howl of the trees to begin. The next part of Zechariah 11 is equally timely for us today. It warns of destroying shepherds. We may know that these shepherds are destroyers because of several key references in the prophecy. Zechariah 
Zechariah 11, verses 4 to 5 says, Thus says Jehovah, my Elohim, Feed the flock of the slaughter, whose possessor slay them, and hold themselves not guilty. And they that sell them say, Blessed be Jehovah, for I am rich, and their own shepherds pity them not. See, Zechariah 11, verse 4, calls the people under the leadership of these shepherds, flock of the slaughter. And the shepherds are judged as possessors who slay them, while not holding themselves guilty for intentionally destroying the sheep. In fact, Zechariah 11 verse 5 says that these shepherds are without pity for the sheep under their cruel leadership. They don't care, or perhaps they're doing it on purpose. Maybe they do care in that sense, because if they're doing it on purpose, they care what the results are. Have you ever felt like sometimes we're living in a world that there's an agenda? I know, strange thought, but I digress. Notably, while Zechariah warns that these destroying shepherds slaughter the sheep and have not pity for them at all, it also tells that the shepherds too will howl in the morning and that the pride of Jordan will be brought to ruin. See, it says, there is a voice of the howling of the shepherds. For the glory is spoiled, the voice of the roaring of young lions for the pride of Jordan is spoiled. So these shepherds are called the pride of Jordan. What does that mean? Well, in Hebrew, the name Jordan means to flow down or descend. Jeremiah 12 verse 5 translated, is translated the pride of Jordan as the swelling of Jordan. It's found here in Jeremiah 12, verse 5, If thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, then, thou, thou, then how canst thou contend with horses? And if the, end, if the land of peace wherein thou trusted, they wearied thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of the Jordan? So from biblical times, the Jordan signifies the power of death. Crossing the Jordan is overcoming death. This understanding is found in ancient hymns. Pilgrim's Progress, written in the 1600s, refers to crossing the Jordan in order to enter heaven at last. Of course, we know that Yahweh's people are likened to sheep, and Yahweh is our good shepherd. But in today's world... Now, just a minute. Some of you guys are laughing. Just because you're sheep doesn't give you an excuse to be bad. Sorry, I had to throw that in there. Okay. And I'm not... See, what shepherd doesn't keep his sheep sheared? And I, I, I love allegories. So I'm going to use an allegory here a little bit with a little humor. So forgive me if you're offended. I'm not trying to offend anybody. But sometimes... The devil is there and he's trying to pull the wool over our eyes. Torah brings the wool up so we can see clearly. That's the power in, in the gift of discernment. Discernment is not your gut. Dis, your gut is based on feelings. As you're walking in Torah, your gut is replaced by godly discernment. And it doesn't feel any different. It's just now you've got the basis of Torah running your life. Any of you ever have a gut feeling and have it be wrong? Yeah. Any of you have a gut feeling and turned out it was right? Yeah. But when you have discernment, it's always right. Godly discernment is always right. God doesn't give you a stone when you ask for a loaf of bread. Does not Scripture tell us that? So again... We know that Yahweh's people are likened to sheep and Yeshua is our good shepherd. But in today's world, many ungodly leaders liken the human population to sheep in a derogatory way. People are called sheeple. In fact, the word sheeple has been added to the online Merriam-Webster dictionary with the following meaning. Sheeple are people who are docile, compliant, or easily influenced. Does that sound like anybody you may know? I pray when you look at the mirror, that's not you. I pray that it's not you. The sheep who will be killed are those who are martyred for their faithfulness to Messiah. In fact, they are following Messiah's example. 
How do I know that? Well, Psalms 44, verse 22. Yea, for the sake we are killed all the day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. But those who reject wisdom are also the sheep of the slaughter. What's wisdom? What is wisdom? Remember, Solomon had wisdom. He was given wisdom by God, right? He asked for wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Yes. Wisdom is knowledge applied to myself or knowledge applied to yourself. Knowledge is great. Does, the, does your scripture ever talk about there being any saved encyclopedias? They're full of knowledge. You see what I'm saying? Were there a lot of knowledgeable people in Yeshua's day when he came the first time? Oh yeah, they were all chosen to be his disciples, weren't they? Not even one of them. No Sadducees, no Pharisees, no members of the Sanhedrin. Do you think it's going to be any different in the last days? I don't know. But I see a pattern. Again, those who reject wisdom are also the sheep of the slaughter. Uh, Proverbs 1, verse 32. For their turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. See, we have an opportunity... To not be simple. Did you know that every single one of us is ordinary? We're all ordinary. But we become extraordinary when we realize that we're bought with a price. Christ's atoning blood over your life and you accepting that atoning blood and choosing for his will to be done in your life makes you extraordinary or extraordinary. That's the only thing that makes you extraordinary. Too often we get full of this thing called pride. I know none of you guys suffer with it, just me. And pride helps us to look at ourselves and, wow, we become Nebuchadnezzar, this great Babylon which I have built. And sometimes God's got to take us out to the pasture and we got to eat grass like a cow for a while. If you're in one of those experiences, understand it's not because God doesn't love you, it's because he does. To whom Yah loves, he coddles and babies. No, to whom Yah loves, he chastens and rebukes. But I tell you, folks, there are many of us today who do not tolerate chastening and rebuking. If you have something critical to say about me, I don't want to hear it. I just want cheerleaders. No. Does the devil use people? Yes, but so does God. What are we supposed to do? Test the spirits. According to what? How they make us feel? See how you've just changed your religion into a feeling-based rather than fact-based? No, to the law and to the testimony. Isaiah 20, if they speak not according, there's no light in it. But if someone is speaking to you, a point of correction, a point of encouragement, receive it. Test the spirit. If there's application, thank Yah for it. Oftentimes, we don't want to look in the mirror. We don't like what we see in the mirror. Welcome to the no mirror club. (laughs) Sometimes I don't like the mirror either. But you know what? As I'm progressing in my life and I look in the mirror, I don't want to see me. I want to see Yeshua working through me. That's all I want to see. I don't care who Mark is. I care all about who Yah is. His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Don't wait for that to start with somebody else. That can start with you. So who are the destroying shepherds? Okay, well... 
We're used to thinking of shepherds as being pastors and religious leaders, and this meaning is present in the Hebrew word for shepherd in this verse. But there is another meaning of the word for shepherd in this prophecy. Shepherd also means generally to rule. So just as the flock who are being slaughtered is a term applying to all who depend on their leaders, so also the shepherds are those who rule or are in a position of leadership or authority. This includes government leaders and the globalists. Folks, I've said this before, and I want to repeat it. I didn't always understand this, but people who are against the God of Torah, the God of the Bible, are preaching a religion. It's not the religion of the Bible. It's a different religion. It's a different God. But they are shepherds. Sadly, through controlling the media and education, the wicked shepherds manipulate people's thinking and they deceive the masses. And the people of the world are acting like lambs to the slaughter, even lining up to take whatever deadly recommended steps their leaderships recommend. They feel safe and secure while freedom is falling all around them. The globalist left-wing ideologies are often compared to Marxism, and in fact, Marxist ideologies are the real basis for the Great Reset. At the 2020 World Economic Forum, uh, chairman and founder Klaus Schwab said the following, The current crisis has shown us that our old systems are not fit anymore. In other words, the leaders of the World Economic Forum, or the WEF, WEF, excuse me, is plainly stating his plan to burn down the old forest exactly as Zechariah 11 warns that they will do. In short, he says, we need a great reset. What are they resetting? Oh, the currency. And, and so I've invested in foreign currency. And so when the Great Reset happens, I'm going to be rich beyond my wildest imaginations. No, you're not. When you realize the freedoms that you lost, no amount of money can cover that. And if you're going to comply with their new rules, guess what? Even if you have money, you won't be able to spend it. You'll be throwing it in the street. Isn't that in Scripture somewhere? Hmm, just, mm-hmm. i got to st- get back to reading my bur- Bible again. I don't know. It seems like I have heard some of this stuff going on. A global movement to reform capitalism is gaining traction by those using uh, things that happened around 2020, came to a head, and call for the Great Reset, if you will. The body pushing the Great Reset happens to be the World Economic Forum. Its charismatic German leader, Klaus Schwab, is calling for a return to Marxist principles, claiming that capitalism has empirically failed. You see the quote on the screen. I have to be careful what I say, but please read it. uh, Klaus Schwab brags that many world leaders have joined him in this cause, pushing for the great global reset, and more and more are advancing to his point of view. And the amazing thing, the World Economic Forum is not, doesn't have right to rule over any nation, kindred, or tongue. But nations are giving the rule to him. Why? Hmm. Shauna, is there a video? Um, Rick, can you turn the video on, the audio? Sorry, I didn't do that. So I'm going to play a video. I believe this is um, Alex Jones. Now, some people, you love Alex Jones. Some of you hate him. Just listen to what he has to say. You ready, Rick? This is uh, Klaus Schwab with David Gergen at the Kennedy Center bragging that he controls the cabinet and controls many of the leaders of the world. And his favorite example of this is Justin Trudeau. Um, when I mention our names like Mrs. Merkel, um, even uh, Vladimir Putin and so on, they all have been young global leaders of the World Economic Forum. Mm-hmm. But um, what we are very proud of now is the young generation like uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, um, president of, Brazil, of uh, Argentina and so on, 
so that we penetrate the cabinets. So yesterday I was at a, rece at a reception for Prime Minister Trudeau, and I know that half of this cabinet, or even more half of uh, half of this cabinet, are for our uh, actually young global leaders of the world economy. Right. Form. And that's true in Argentina too. Wow. Yeah. Sorry. That's true in Argentina as well. It's true in Argentina. And, right, let's, uh, let's cut that off. He goes on and brags. It's everywhere. People are. With China as its model, the can and Canada's Trudeau and China's Xi Peng uh, being touted as exemplary members of the movement, Klaus Schwab is working to build what he calls a new world, a better world, a fairer world. And folks, it will not be, well, it might be new, but it's not new. It certainly is not better. And it will not be fairer. Not to us. Not to anybody. Well, Klaus Schwab continued. He said, we have to mobilize all constituents of our global society, which means the main leaders of government, science, and business to work together. Those are the shepherds that the Bible is warning you about. Not the good shepherds, the false shepherds, the bad shepherds, the leaders. And we can make sure that the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution are best utilized to provide us with better lives. What's he calling better lives? Better lives are those who come into compliance with the new rule, the new source of authority, which will not be the Torah, will not be Bible-based. It will be a different Bible, but it will not be the Christian Bible, if you will. Klaus Schwab has not only authored the book uh, that you see the name on the screen, The Great Reset. You see the first part. I can't say that. He has also dedicated a large portion of the World Economic Forum official website to articles such as, Does Capitalism Need Some Marxism to Survive the Industrial Fourth Revolution? 75 years ago, following World War II, countries and people came together to shape the post-war global order. He says, now is the historical moment in time not only to fight the virus, but to shape the system for the post-corona era. Klaus Schwab saying that. What's he saying? Never let a crisis go by without advancing your cause. That's what globalists after globalists say. We never, oh, we, a crisis, that's great. We can advance our cause, whatever it takes, whatever we do. People die, <sighs> that's just fodder for the fire. This, casualties of war, they're necessary for the greater good. As Sky News video put out uh, by Concerned Australians pointed out, Capitalism indeed creates inequality, but it is also the only system which rewards individual hard work and innovation and also creates equality. But throughout recent history, the Marxist principles Schwab endorses are stained with blood. See, capitalism is not necessarily fair because, Marlene, if you choose to work hard and you prosper, you can become richer than I am. That's not fair. That's capitalism. If I want to sit on my if I want to sit on my haunches and do nothing, I'll be poor. And there's Marlene making all this money. She's working hard, but I'm poor. That's not fair. Marlene, you need to give me some of that money. Because I deserve it. That's not capitalism. That's socialism. Continuing with Klaus Schwab, he says, we have to mobilize all constituents of our global society to work together. We must not miss this unique window of opportunity. And yes, he is taking the opportunity. He's working hard. Since ancient Babylon, many earthly powers have wanted to rule the world. 
As we see in the image from Daniel chapter 2, the powers that succeeded in global domination are represented by a single metal. The last power to dominate, to dominate the whole world was pagan Rome, which is represented in the iron legs of the image. And now as we live in the last days, we find ourselves in the time of the feet, with the political powers orchestrated by a global elite who are a shadow government. Once again, globalization or full global dominance is the goal. We live in serious times. Things are taking place around us that we wouldn't have believed possible even 40 years ago. Freedoms are being lost. Patriotism is passe. And national sovereignty is being challenged. These changes have been carefully orchestrated over time through a process called globalization. Globalization has... Here's the definition of globalization. Globalization. The process of concentration of power over all mankind in one person or a small group. That sounds like a dictatorship to me. And not a good one. Globalization has been attempted many times in Earth's history. Each nation which tried to rule the world from Babylon to Rome has attempted it. And why has it failed? Because only God's ways will prevail. In the end, this will not prevail. Yah's ways will prevail. Don't take my word for it. Read your Bible. <laughs> it's in there. Did you know that, the Bible pro that Bible prophecy warned us that there would be shadow governments in the last days? See, the term shadow government means a government run by an unelected bureaucracy or a state within a state or deep state. Daniel 8, verse 23 to 25. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up, and his power shall be mighty, but not of his own power, and he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper in practice, and to destroy the mighty and holy people. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he, sh and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. By peace destroy many? Yeah. The call for peace, hey, you got to get rid of these. We have a new system. We have a new way, and you got these Torah observant people over here. They're bucking the system. It's not going to work. Go get them, boys. Oh, well, I'm shadow. I, 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 I'm... I'm, I'm Torah observant, but I'm just being quiet about it. And, and later on, when my time comes, I'm going to shine forth. No, you're not. What you're doing today will define what you'll do tomorrow. Plain and simple. When's the day of your day? When is the day of your salvation? Today. Plain and simple. There's some key words in here. So I've read the text to you. I wanted to find some of those terms that are underlined. I, I, I need to kind of move here a little fast uh, because of time. But the latter time is the last or the end or the future. Fierce is strong, mighty, or greedy. Countenance is the face of the battle, anger. Dark sentences means a trick or dark sayings, hard questions, a riddle. And uh, shall stand up means to ra they will raise up to power. To destroy means to corrupt or to ruin. Wonderfully here is from the word meaning to accomplish hard, hidden things. Policy means intelligence. Craft means deceiving, fraud, and treachery. Peace means the desire for security, abundance, and quietness. And folks, this is important. Because in the last days, how are the people of the world going to be taken out? Just like Adam and Eve were taken out from the very beginning. Deception. They will be deceived. Well, it sounds good. It seems right. Well, oh, I like this plan. It sounds great. Oh, no, it fails. Why? Because they never sat down and found the beauty, the safety net in Torah. The observance of Yah's ways will always save you in the end. Doesn't mean the world's going to be happy with you. Look what they did to your Messiah. 
Doesn't the Bible warn us? You saw how they treated me. Don't expect to get treated any better. You know how I interpret that? This is my translation of that. I'm not perfect. My Messiah was perfect. I'm not. You take a, you take a, a, a mud ball of accusations and throw them at Mark, some of them are going to stick. Okay? Eh, then they're done that. Sorry. Yeah. Repented. Move forward. Don't continue that. See, sometimes we suffer for our own stupidity, sinfulness. Yeshua is telling us, you saw how they treated me. He did everything right. He was Torah observant. He did everything right according to Jehovah's law, right? Mm -hmm. And what did the world do? They hated him for it. Why? Because when you live a righteous life, it points out the sinfulness of the unrighteous, and they're not going to be happy about it. So who do you think you are? You self-righteous, they, they have some bad words Christians don't say. <laughs> have you ever been hit with stuff like that? I have. It's not fun. This is like, okay, that's the way you feel. Can't fix it. I can't. God can. I can't. Having seen that the shepherds are the wicked leaders of the world in the last days, we are, we're now ready to look at what the Bible means by calling these end time leaders foolish. Zechariah eleven fifteen and Yahweh said unto me, Take unto thee yet the instruments of a foolish shepherd. So let's take a look at this. Fools are unwise. This is how the Bible describes a fool. Psalms 94, verse 8. Understand ye brutish among the people, and ye fools, when will ye be wise? Proverbs 23, 9. Speak not in the ears of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of thy words. Fools embrace human wisdom and lack spiritual discernment. See, there's really no such thing as human wisdom. It's human foolishness. Wisdom is Yah's. I'm sorry. It's, it's, wisdom really comes from Yah. Solomon got that. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 19. For the wisdom of the, this world is foolishness with Yah, for it is written, He takes the wise in their own craftiness. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14, But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of Yah, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Meaning, spiritually discerned here means heavenly spiritually discerned. You need to be careful nowadays, folks. I was just on the phone with someone this week, and they were mentioning how someone uh, was helping them out and how, how they were spiritual. And I said to them, you know, to now, today, nowadays, you got to be a little bit more specific. Uh, when someone tells me they're spiritual, I, okay, uh, what spirit are you following? <laughs> because there's a good spirit, an uh, evil spirit, and a, uh, a, a good spirit. There's two different spirits. And just because someone says spiritual, oh, I'm spiritual. And they could be really nice, and they have a big old smile on their face, even some makeup on or whatever. They look good. They look great. Mm -mm. To the law and to the testimony, to speak not according. Depart. Run. See ya. Let them go out your door. <laughs> Bye. Now, I know it sounds judgmental, but the fact is we can't tolerate it. Because it, it's not a matter of if it will take you down, it's when it will take you down. And we can't do that to each other. You know, we need to be walking in the truth ourselves. So again, 1 Corinthians 2, 14, but the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of Yah, for they are foolishness unto him. See, God's ways are different than our ways. He works way outside of what we call the box. The box is what I understand and, and, and what you understand. And folks, our box is really, really narrow. But see, God... He works on the whole tapestry. He's got the big picture in mind. And uh, I don't know about you, but uh, I'll be very quick. Uh, my experience with Yah is that he'll say, Mark, I need you to da 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 do, 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 do this, whatever. And I said, okay. And I figure we're going to go this way. And God says, no, I want you to go this way. I'm like, but God, this way would be quicker. He says, no, you're going to go this way. And I'm like, okay. I'm going to the point in my life. I'm saying, okay, God, I'm following you. I'm not, you're not following me. I don't want you to follow me. I want to follow you. So I follow him. He takes, it's not necessarily the scenic route. He takes a way that is just opposed to my thinking. And I go through it. And at the end of it, I'm going, wow, y'all, you not only did this, you did this and this and this and this along the way. 
And I'm like, wow. And you know, the next time it goes around, guess what? God says, okay, we're going to do this. Okay, God, which way are we going? We're going that way. Well, I thought, okay, yeah, let's go. And I don't question it. I don't question it. Why? Because his ways are above my ways, above my thinking, my understanding. And as you walk, you become spiritually discerned, more and more spiritually discerned, that when Yah asks us to do, it's, it's just like, okay, let's go. You get excited. It's a good thing. Anyway, how does the Bible, again, describe a fool? Fools are immoral. Psalms 53, verse 1, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. Corrupt are they and have done abominable iniquity. There is none that doeth good. Fools are deceptive and slanderous. Proverbs 10, verse 18, He that hideth hatred with lying lips, and he that uttereth a slander is a fool. Other parts of the scripture says, that your yea be yea and your nay, nay. Today, people manipulate you upside one down the other. And it's just not for your own goodness. How do you know you're being manipulated? When someone's gaining an advantage over you at your demise. And guess what? It won't feel like that when you're being manipulated. You got, you got to pray for discernment daily. In, in each aspect and he throughout the day you know paul used to say oh not paul used to he says in his in the scripture in the new testament paul says i die daily i don't know about you but sometimes i got to die several times throughout the day and lean on in my own ways because sometimes boy i like to pick up the reins and say oh i got this god no 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 i I lay those reins to god you got this why are we lying if you're lying it's because you're hiding from the truth. And remember in Thessalonians, because you receive not a love of the truth, I, Jehovah, will send you strong delusions so that you will believe a lie. Truth is important to the God of heaven. If God is, if you're having to lie about something, God forbid, repent of it and stop it. Live in the truth. Fools are prideful. Proverbs 14, verse 3, In the mouth of the foolish is a rod of pride, but the lips of the wise shall preserve them. Fools are opinionated and loud-mouthed. A fool's voice is known by multitude of words. A fool, uh, Ecclesiastes 10, verse 14, A fool also is full of words. A man cannot tell what shall be and what shall be after him. Who can tell him? There's an old Chinese Proverbs. Let me use the Chinese Proverbs here. I think it's based upon this. It says, Better to be silent and let everyone think that you're smart than open your mouth and remove all doubt. Okay. <laughs> Fools reject the commands of Jehovah. 1 Samuel 13, 13. Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of Yahweh thy Elohim. Matthew 7, verse 26, And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and does them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. Do you know there's New Testament Christians say, oh, we don't keep the law of God, we just observe it. I'm like, you need to look that Greek word up. Oh, yeah, oh, no, my pastor said, we just look at it. We just look at it. How dumb is that? Sorry, I know you're supposed to call your brother Rock a fool, but the fact is that this, we're talking about fools, and that's what they think. Oh, we observe it. We, we learn from it. What does it mean? Okay, if you're a child, and you go over, and, and you go, I know none of you ever did this, just me, and I've got the burns to prove it. Anyway, um, you ever go out, you're a little, little child, you go up by the, the stove in the kitchen, and mama says, don't touch the stove, it's hot. And as a rebellious child that I was, uh, you, you go up there, and I, oh, well, I want to touch it. No, don't touch it. It's hot. Which is, all, all I hear is don't touch it. You're not, all I hear is, you're not letting me do what I want to do. Mom, you're violating my purpose of freedom to be able to do what I want to do. This is a free country. Don't you read the Geneva Convention, Mom? And so I go up to this little child, and what do I do? I touch the stove. Ah! I burn myself. And now I know what hot is. Hmm. What did I learn? Don't touch the stove. See, too many times in our rebellious aspect, we look at Torah and we go, oh, I can't do this and I can't do that. That's not what it's about. 
the Torah is like, if you step outside of my Torah, Mark, you will be hurt. By who? By Satan. And he's more than glad to hurt you. Why? Because when you're hurt, your heavenly father's hurt. Matthew 7, 26, that everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened as a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. What are you building on? Your own ideas? That's sand. Who's the rock? Peter wasn't the rock. Yeshua HaMashiach is the rock. And what was he based on? The law of Jehovah. Not my will, but thy will be done. He said, I go about my father's business. Foolish things lead into sin and destruction. Psalms 107 verse 17. Fools because of their transgression and because of their iniquities are afflicted. Proverbs 26 11, For as a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. Fools seek to know or trust their own hearts. Proverbs 18, verse 2, A fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. Proverbs 28, verse 26, He that trusts in his own heart is a fool, but whosoever walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. What is this, what is this saying? It's saying, don't follow what you feel like you want to do. Do what's right because it's the right thing to do. And that's, that's Torah observance. Torah is doing right because it's the right thing to do. It's not doing wrong because it's the wrong thing to do. Well, I'm not going to tell this person. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to tell them a lie. Why? Because that's what I feel like to do today. No. That's being a fool. Here are a few sobering examples of ways that the destroying shepherds are slaughtering the sheep today. The Maui fires are highly suspicious. Here are nine questions that we should be asking. You all know about Maui. Lots of devastation. Last time I heard there were 99 people uh, confirmed dead. There were like 1,000 missing. That that's numbers dropped. They found some of them alive, thank God. But uh, there's still a lot missing. I don't know what the current number is. I didn't look it up. 106. 106? That's not too bad. <laughs> that's a lot of people. The Maui resident uh, says we are winning against fires until the water was shut off. Why was the water shut off? Why would they shut the water? Firefighters, if you get online and look, you'll find it. Firefighters are stating, this is really weird. The water was shut off. Firefighters are telling you this. Why would they shut the water off? What's going on? First-hand witnesses believe the disaster was planned. Investigators believe that the deadly wildfire that raged under... Uh, Control started due to electricity failures and not by natural causes. Uh, there's stuff online saying, oh, it was some brush over by these things over here. Others, there's, there's things coming down from the sky um, from a certain country that's about, if you keep digging a hole through the other side, you get to the other side, you'll be in that country. Um, that's what my dad used to tell me. I never dug a hole that deep. Investigators believe, again, uh, Mike, Michael Watts, who has won millions of dollars in settlements on other wildlife cases, commented that all evidence, videos, witness accounts, burn progression, and, and utility equipment remaining points to Hawaiian Electric's equipment being the ignition source of the fire that devastated Lahaina. Uh, anyway, you can read the article later if you so choose, but uh, the point is, it looks like it was, this was planned. Uh, my daughter was looking at it and says, Dad, it's really interesting. You've got whole neighborhoods over here burned, but you've got these nice big mansions over here, the elite. Their houses are fine. Huh. Hmm. I don't know. I know. I'm being a conspiracy theorist. Uh, Biden administration to invest $1.2 million in projects to suck carbon out of the air. Isn't that great news? Uh, they're terraforming the planet through planetary-scale atmospheric alterations. Large-scale efforts are underway right now to alter the chemistry of planet Earth by removing CO2 in the atmosphere through carbon uh, sequestration efforts. Since CO2 is necessary for all photosynthesis, which drives the web of life on planet Earth, this effort could collapse all food crops, rainforest, 
marine ecosystems, and more. Without CO2 in the atmosphere, there's essentially no recognizable life on planet Earth, and yet the entire climate cult, machine, and nearly all Democrats, media, propagandists, government regulators, globalists, etc., are at war with CO2 and are trying to completely eliminate it from the Earth's atmosphere. What am I saying? Am I saying that the new green deal is not Torah-based? Yes, I am. Because there's nothing about being green. The only thing that's getting green is lining people's pockets. Can I jump back to the Maui fire real quick? The current administration sitting in the White House, on the day they announced another ungodly billion dollar amount, I can't remember how many it was, it was billions of dollars, going to a war that's going on in Ukraine, announced cash payments to the victims of the Maui disaster of $700 each. Don't tell me this isn't planned and not coordinated. Come on. It's a joke. In case you guys don't know, we, we all as humans breathe in what? Oxygen. What do trees breathe? CO2. All green plant life breathes in CO2. So produce CO2. Yeah, good. That's good for you to produce CO2. Breathe all you can because you're producing CO2, which feeds the trees. And then in turn, the trees turn around and feed you. We don't need to be spending $1.2 billion to... Anyway... Geoengineering-driven global famine is set to unleash mass starvation. While we already covered CO2 sequestration and terraforming operations above, <clears throat> this point refers to geoengineering weather control that guides water mass dispersion to produce flood, drought, storms, or anything else that can damage crops and cause widespread food scarcity and food inflation. When you look at globalist plans, you see <clears throat> yeah, the Georgia Guidestones. You guys all know those were destroyed, right? Well, the stones were destroyed, but the plan is still going full force. They want to limit this Earth's population. As I recall, it's 500 million. And the last time I checked, we were about 8.7 billion. So that's 8.2 billion of us going bye-bye. Huh? Is it 8 billion? I thought it was 8. Point. Yeah, it's almost it. Yeah, it's going up. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> they tried to tell you that during since 2020 because of this mass depopulation event that was supposedly going on that our, our numbers had dropped. They didn't. They continued rising up. But anyway, I digress. I have to be careful how I say things. A lot of the geoengineering-driven stuff that you see on your screen is to do population control. They're still working. The, their, it's in their documentation. You ought to look it up. It ought to be, wait a minute, why are they in charge? They shouldn't be in charge. And how do we make a difference? I don't know. We gotta start, you just got to start with yourself. There's a coordinated global effort to destroy seed diversity and make crops unable to reproduce. To make sure that free people can't grow their own food, a global effort is also underway to control the seed supply and to collapse seed diversity while transitioning agriculture to toxic genetically engineered seeds that grow crops with, which synthesize pesticide chemicals right into the crop itself, such as uh, GM corn, genetically modified corn. Seed giants like Monsanto, which is now uh, owned by Bayer, have brought up many smaller seed suppliers over the years. It's been going on for a long time, uh, and it continues, wiping out seed diversity and nearly monopolizing the agriculture supply chain for crop production. Someone was just sharing me, with me that uh, one of their friends doesn't buy almonds anymore from the West Coast because they're all pasteurized. That's a nice little way of saying that they're fixed so that they're not, they won't produce. You can't seed them. So they get their almonds from another source. And it hap their source happens to be back east. But eventually that will go out too. This centralization of food production into the hands of a few powerful corporations, one of the necessary steps to weaponizing food scarcity and using engineered famine as a tool for social control and mass compliance with government demands. How are they doing this? Well, they create the crisis and they have the solution for the crisis. So... 
Oh, we've got this crisis. We have the solution. And we will help you. Nein. You will own nothing and you will be happy. These are actual statements made by Klaus Schwab. I'm not joking. And it ought to be alarming. What's alarming to me is how many nations are following his protocol, including the United States. Rapid rollout of automation robots to replace blue-collar workers and transport drivers. Laborers are about to be made obsolete thanks to a slew of automation robots that are about to be unleashed upon the workforce. Warehouse workers will soon be replaced by bipedal warehouse robots that can handle nearly all the same tasks. And commercial drivers who work for UPS, FedEx, United States Postal Service, and various trucking companies, they'll soon find themselves obsolete and out of work. That may not be a bad thing because I don't know if you've tried to ship anything United States States U.S. Postal Service lately, but you got to fill out a lot of forms. <laughs> so maybe the robots can do it faster. I don't know. I'm teasing. Uh, I mean, that's true, but I don't want people replaced. Um, in agriculture, it won't be long before crop picking robots replace the migrant laborers, and even in construction, robots will take over many tasks currently handled by humans. It won't take long for the robot labor force to have a serious negative impact on people's ability to work and provide for themselves. And what will happen, as I understand my research, is that the government will pay you. No, the government will control you. You'll get what you need from the government. And you need to pay attention because the Bible warns of about uh, the system about not being able to buy or sell. And that's having a much larger impact. And it's being carried out in a way that may be a little bit different than many of us have thought in the past. Just be flexible when it comes to um, prophecy being actually carried out. Sometimes not going to ca carry it out exactly the way we thought it would. So there's the rise of the artificial in uh, intelligence systems to replace white-collar workers, journalists, artists, coders, writers, and more. If you thought your job was safe because you're a white-collar worker, think again. Regeneration AI systems like ChatGPT are on the move and will soon replace journalists, writers, coders, business managers, lawyers, and much more. Infertility chemicals are being placed in the food supply through herbicides. Atrazine, glycophosphate, hormone disruptors, to, to re, and they're doing this to reduce population sustainability. It's true that ultrazine, the number two most common herbicide in our food supply, is a chemical castrator that makes frogs unable to reproduce. The science is there. I know, it's riveting. Sorry. In doing so, it also causes loss of reproductive vitality, leading to population reduction. We currently test for astrazine in our mass spec food science laboratory. This is Mike Adams. And we can confirm that we are seeing atrazine in the human food supply. We also test for glycophosphate and heavy metals, among other things, and we see a lot of contamination of the food supply chain. Why are they doing this? Population control. I talk to a lot of young people. I don't just talk to young people. I talk to old people, too, so you're all safe. I mean, if you're young or old, I talk to everybody. I wasn't calling you all old. That, that came across wrong. My point is this. There are a lot of young people today that are choosing not to bear children. And I have to wonder if they are being chemically manipulated. I mean, I, it's, 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 an ex, it's an excessive amount. It's a lot. And you're like, I do know some people that are attempting to reproduce and cannot. And it's, it's, it's becoming more and more. Do you, in my lifetime, have, have, perhaps some of you have noticed this. I don't think it's just me. Have you noticed more and more people coming down with this thing called cancer? Cancer's not being reduced. Can't. Cancer, if anything, is being reproduced. There's more and more issues of cancer. Well, there's more and more issues of infertility happening. More and more. Hmm. So, what is the point to all this? 
Could Zechariah be warning us that things are coming to an end? See, we live in a time after the fall of the cedars, folks. The old vintage forest has been consumed. The destroying shepherds have in numerous ways intentionally brought the people of the world like sheep to the slaughter. These shepherds have no pity. They have no sense of their guilt. But Yahweh has given us a vital prophecy for this time in this earth's history. This prophecy found in Zechariah 11 tells us that the destroying shepherds will be destroyed and that Yahweh himself will ultimately ruin death. But because of the works of these false shepherds, not only are people being physically destroyed, but spiritually as well. Yahweh's people must stand firmly upon the truth of his word. We must not be taken down by deception. And folks, there's all kinds of deception. And I wish I could talk to you about Hollywood. You know, the, the famous people in Hollywood, they're called Hollywood stars. In scripture, it, it's an allegory. In scriptures, a third of the stars fell from heaven. And we have Hollywood stars, we have rock stars. In you know, how do you define, or is everyone in Hollywood evil and corrupt? I don't know. That's between them and God. Uh, I'm not saying they are or they're not. I will say this, though. If your time and attention is spent in glorifying and honoring a human being over the God of heaven, you have a crisis in your life that needs to be addressed. Is that, is that, is that fair enough? Who's the only one worthy of worship? Yeshua. Yeshua. It's in the basis of the commandment. The first four commands are all about worshiping him and him alone. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And folks, the folks, what's going on in Hollywood, what's going on in the rock world today and country music, all kinds of stuff. And I know there's some good people there, but folks, we've got to be careful. Don't be worshiping them. I enjoy good music. I don't think rock music's good, but that's my opinion. That's my perception, as I understand it. I like things that um, try to lift me up, put my soul towards heaven. And, and I, I measure everything. Is this drawing me closer to heaven or taking me away? Because it's one or the other. The destroying shepherds will be destroyed in the end. Yahweh himself will ultimately ruin the death that they're trying to put upon his sheep, Yehovah's sheep. But because of the work of these false shepherds, not only are people being physically destroyed, but spiritually as well, Yahweh's people must stand firmly upon the truth in his, in his word. We must not be taken down by deception, folks. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sin. Who's Yah's calling out? He's calling out his people for the whole world will be wondering after the beast. Folks, it's time to come out. This has been the August 19th, 2023 edition of World Watch. Thank you for listening. <laughs>